1998. Um, but uh, this work in particular um, was started about a year and a half ago. Um, Kim and I mostly just talk on the phone um, or we uh, write letters to each other. So we're in contact often, but just sort of sporadically, whenever the mail comes, whenever the phone rings. And um, so for this piece, we were really talking about uh, player pianos. Um, my grandmother had one. There's also a very eerie computerized player piano at the corporate office building where I work. And um, so Kim said, why don't I just mail you some distressed paper and just write on them, and I'll pretend that I'm a player piano, and I'll turn those into paintings. So you can see these drawings um, on paper that Kim had pierced uh, and sent to me from, from Berkeley, California. And then when I had a chance, um, I would kind of write on them um, in a kind of automatic fashion, just sort of whatever was on my mind, and send them back to Kim. And then she used them through a process of making drawings and uh, drafts, and she used them as maps to create uh, the abstract paintings you see. So we're really interested in um, what uh, has been turned uh, in, in, in the study of Paul Clay's work, um, the legible and invisible, and thinking about what an abstraction is legible. What can you read, for example, in these abstractions or in the work of um, Joan Mitchell or whomever? And um, what's visible in handwriting? What about handwriting it resembles drawing, <coughs> resembles the shapes, the expressive forms, and so forth um, of a uh, uh, brain? Um, and, and of, of art. So as you can see, they've become very mixed in my mind. Um, so thanks very much for coming to this event, which actually is very much related uh, to the work on the walls. Um, this is an event where uh, editors of Prelude Magazine, uh, Rob Crawford and Stu Watson, thought about this uh, um, collaborative work that Kim and I worked on and said that they would put together <clears throat> a, uh, a kind of evening of dialogues, sort of a whole variety of dialogues. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really uh, excited to see what they put together. And thank you all for coming out on this insanely hot uh, night and for suffering through that and coming here. And I think it's going to be all worth it. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you um, Rob Crocker. Thanks, Chris, and uh, yeah, I'll go and check out you know, the art later today. It's, it's awesome stuff. Uh, as he said, this is a, an evening of dialogues and drama, kind of looking at the boundaries between poetry and performance. Uh, so without further ado, let's start with the Black Court duo, Simone Blazer and Charles Galeppi. Simone is an organic chemist, and Charles produces reality television, so that's quite something already. Uh, together, they curate the reading series called Rat Court, and they also stage collaborative performances. Tonight's performance is called And Related. Here is Rat Court. which could almost have been called friendship, if friendship did not seem too excessive a term for two people who were so unsociable. It's good, but I remember it being better. These were all their intimacies, their celebrations. But I remember it being better. Have you ever seen a skewer? No, it's that. It's one of those things that looks like another thing with the function, except this thing, the functionality is gone. You like know, a frying pan that's actually a pillow. Like a typewriter that's actually a painting. Oh yes, a skewer. I wouldn't have spelled it like that. But yeah. When I found out how it was spelled, I was shocked. 
Was that when they put the electrodes on? Funny little things, yes. Didn't I tell you about that fruit stand? You don't like to be too predictable. It's the one I always go to, but I don't like to be too predictable. It's like that time in the Maldives. Massachusetts? In Midtown. You know what that reminds me of? You remind me of Whipper Wallace, back in the good old days. He used to go on about with that House Peters, Bog House Peters we used to call him. I remember one day the Whipper in Bog House, he had a scar on his left cheek, Bog House, caught in some Bog House brawl. I suppose while well, anyway, there we were, the Whipper and Bog House, rolling down by the banks of the Euphrates that night when up came a policeman and... And up came a policeman and... Up came a policeman and... This policeman approached the Whipper and Bog House were questioned this night, the Euphrates, a policeman. He was carried away by that mania of the storyteller who never knows which stories are more beautiful. Was it the ones that really happened in the evocations of which recalls a whole flow of hours past, of petty emotions, boredom, happiness, insecurity, vanity and self-disgust? Or was it those stories which are invented, in which he cuts out the main pattern, everything seems easy, and then he begins to vary it, just as he realizes more and more things that have happened or been understood as lived reality. So he shuttlecocked the food under the door, and I saw his eye fluctuate and strangle, and I said to him, hey, your general eye is about to, but then I remembered that he probably doesn't speak English. I've lost count. You've been working out. You've noticed. Did you just hear that? Chopping wood. He always does that. Say, Max, he used to kill his wife and three kids with. Cell block three. Right there. Cell block three. Locking groups. So the edges are all carbons and hydrogens. It's pretty easy on paper to manipulate benzene rings, which, through an electrophilic substitution reaction, can take on different groups, kind of like extremities. You could have meta-directing groups, for example, which withdraw electron density from the ring, or you could add blocking groups, too. They kind of act like a buttress for a backside attack. Sometimes I think I'm not feminine enough for you. Sometimes we'd have to get creative in the lab. Sometimes I wonder if the child really is the father of man. Sometimes I wonder if the father is the problem. What's this brown paper? I found it on the ground and just stuck it to my fridge. This is not a song. Dear Doctor, Mr. Doctor, your esteemed doctorness, salutations, Doctor, 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 no, Doctor, dear Doctor, I am writing you today as I am slightly stuck in what's possibly a miasmatic situation. You see, I was doing fairly okay until one day in early October of 2012, when, with no warning whatsoever, I developed a soreness in my lower back, just above my hips. After a few days, I went to a local clinic where they figured I had a backache. I bet it was two weeks gone before UTI was discovered. Now here come the bacterium, full on into November. Later, more, then something else. Well, in June of 2014, I developed some other infection. Not sure exactly what it was. The cause, I wasn't told, but here comes Cipro for that. I'd always heard unpleasant things about Cipro, and I was worried. I do eat yogurt on the side with plenty of space in between doses of antibiotic and yogurt. Well, the Cipro, after I finished it, seemed to cause some ankle swelling. I may add that I believe I had a puppy stomach after taking that antibiotic, and it gave me swelling elsewhere, too. 
about the stomach bloating. Not sure exactly when I looked down one day and said to myself, what happened to my stomach? All of a sudden, a big, bloated, ugly gut. I'd had a bit of a stomach before, but nothing like this. Well, you can tell these medical people in Bushwick all kinds of complaints, but it seems to fall on deaf ears. I was going around huffing and puffing with this big, fat, unsightly gut, but all they gave me was an inhaler and water pills and all that. I never did bother with either too much. I need good caring advice. I feel lousy and lonely and abandoned, sitting in a camper and no TV. The dogs and cats in the other cells do better than that, I know. Any solution? Anything? Thanks and grateful for whatever you can do. Yours, sincerely, no, sincerely yours. With thanks, best wishes for a happy holiday to you and yours. Midnight at the oasis. Put your camel to bed. Shadows painted on faces, traces of romance in our heads. That's a reference to a funny old song. Do you think I should part my hair on the side? No. Wait. Yes. I dreamed a dream of time gone by. I dreamed of hope that went on living. I dreamed that truth could never I die. I dreamed that truth would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. From a complete invention, they had arrived by successive approximations at an almost entirely truthful account of the facts. You know what that reminds me of? You remind me of Whipper Wallace back in the good old days. Now the Whipper, it was summer, the streets were sizzling hot and strung out. Whipper, steamy, I remember it was steamy and strung out, sizzling, sizzling hot. It was summer when that Whipper was there. Oh God, it was summer. Oh, it, finding some kind of peace in that summer was simply impossible. That solitary summer. Simple? It wasn't simple. Not so simple at all. That season, summer, scribbling on my stationery, just stories, just sending out samples of my stories on fine stationery. Got from my sister. The only thing I was ever any good at was making shit up stories. This night, the Euphrates, steamy policemen stopped by the cops. Thanks, Thanks.